Hi guys, welcome to episode 3 of this 600 horsepower red block build. In this episode we are going to try to assemble the engine and uh, we have got some last parts to this, the piston rings. Um, right now we are going to measure the compression ratio. Let's start to measure the compression ratio. I get cylinder 4 in the right position with the camshaft in the cylinder head so I can measure the compression ratio. I just applying some grease around the gasket area. I just have this clear plexi glass here. Make sure that it's sealed around. So and I have, uh, I filled it up to 100 milliliters and I'm going to fill this in the combustion chamber. Probably one milliliter left in the crater here. 53, 53 milliliters in the combustion chambers. With this in mind, we can calculate the compression ratio. And over to the computer. Here is my favorite engine compression ratio calculator. I'm gonna give you a link in the description of this video. So in my case, I'm going to use millimeters, so I'm I'm putting a number two here. So cylinder bore size is 96 millimeters. Piston stroke is 80 millimeters. Head gasket bore diameter is often a little bit larger than the cylinder and in this case it's 97 millimeters. Uh, and the compressed head gasket thickness. On a standard head gasket this is around one 0.2 millimeters and the combustion chamber volume in cubic uh, and that was measured 53 milliliters which is the same piston dome volume in CSS negative for dish dome and we have the dish dome and I calculate the the piston to have five centiliters 5 milliliter or centiliter or whatever you call it. Enter the piston deck clearance negative if the above deck. And in our case we got 0. Uh, minus 0.2 millimeters and we can calculate compression ratio. And in this case we have 985 to 1 in compression compression ratio and I am think I'm really happy with that. In, in my world it's good around 9.5 to 10.0 so 985 is a good number. Okay we're going to weigh the pistons. I'm going to speed ahead on this one. So I'm going to talk with, with you again when I have the finished results. So, here we have the results, 521.5, 522, 519.5 and 522. So this is the less weighing uh, piston and we need to get all the other pistons down to this value. So and how do we do that? Uh, you can see under here you get this big um, chunk of aluminium. In this one we are trying to lose the weight at first and if you really really must you can do some spot drilling in the 
focus. You can do some spot drilling in the bottom here, but th these pistons are so thin in the top, so I don't want to do that. I I'm going to try to, um, to pair, pair this so good as I can, and if we have some uh, tweaks to do about the uh, rods, we can assemble the pistons so they are best as possible. Okay, I have fiddled around a little bit with the pistons to get them in the same weight. And the pistons that have the highest weight was the highest amount of work. I have to grind all this plateau off the piston to get at 519 grams. This one, it's only required some spot drilling. Same with this, I have to grind all the way. And this is the untouched. Back to the rods. This one is 704 grams, 704.5 grams. 705. 705. 705. We, have, we are 0.5 grams off on the rods, but I can't really fight 0.5 grams and I'm going to let it go on 0.5 grams. We are going to check the wrist pins that set in the engine. And remember, this was an 800 horsepower red block engine before we tear it down. So this pins set in the engine and I can feel a slight wear of the the wrist pin exactly where the bushing to the corner rod has sit and if you're doing this at home it's kind of hard to get the right numbers on this they should be 23 millimeters point zero 23.0 point zero but if it if you have run it in a high horsepower application they might be twisted or have get out of shape so you can do a really fast thing in your own garage just lay an a caliper on the side and see if it's leaking some lights between the caliper and the and the wrist pin and do this at some parts of the wrist pin if it's oval you're gonna see it right now. I can't really see any problem with this. Maybe, maybe, maybe some slight light at these and these places where the corn rod has really put some forces to it. Maybe you can see it, but it's very hard to see. And I, but I can feel a slight wear. Here I have another used wrist pin from another engine. This is in fairly good condition. I do the same test with this. No problem at all. I don't think this will be any problem to use either, but I have this, so why not put them in the engine? I have to clean them up and I'm going to polish them a light polish so they are nice and shiny again. Time for piston rings. I bought this set of piston rings, Colburn Schmidt. Going to try them out, never used them before. And one thing I have to notice here is if you can see here in the edge of the ring it's a little bit lighter material. That's because these rings are chrome plated. And if you have too rough surface in the cylinders and not plateau the, the cylinders, the chrome plating is just turned apart when you're starting the engine. So you really have to have a break the, the honings apart when using this ring. But in this stage, we're going to measure the the, the end gap of the ring in the bore. So I'm inserting the ring here. I printed this little thing. 
it's an it's an offsetter you can use to place the ring in the bore so you are in the same height every time you are measuring it and when the cylinder is honed like it is right now I really can't choose what kind of gap I want I have to use whatever I get from the rings here I'm going to starting off with 0 0.75 that nuts fit 0 0.50s fit if we got something like 60 or so I will be very pleased we're going to try 60 between yeah maybe have 60 together can't really fit 60 so we're going to check exactly what it is right now 58 58 fits so we have 58 on the top ring 0 0.58 millimeters on the top ring and I'm very pleased with something around 0.6 or something when it's a turbo engine like this so if, if the other rings are like 0 0.58 I'm going to leave them like that on the top ring the second ring I'm going to open up just slightly to get the pressure between the rings I'm going to show you here on the second ring I'm going to open up from if I have 58 on the top ring I'm going to use about 0.5 more on the second ring so I got 60 65 should work good that's because if you got compression ratio compression between the rings because if you're forcing the compression back up to the com to this compression ring you're going to lift the ring and it's going to be unseated in the cylinder and you got all sorts of situation going so if you're putting 0 0.05 millimeters in the second ring you will be fine second ring looking a little bit different same width at the base but they have taken off a little bit of uh, size on the and that's running against the cylinder this will create less friction it's a good thing insert it in the block yes 58 is working 0 0.05 millimeters I'm going to grind this so we get that ratio between the upper and the lower ring here we have a piston ring filer this is or grinder I should call it this is all hand cranked and a really analog tool but it's working really fine and this is a cheap tool that you can buy from Summit Racing or Yeggs or something like that I think they are around um, 30 bucks or something like that when you're grinding the rings I can, I can grind it on this side when you're grinding the rings you have to make sure that the ring ends really closes and don't get uh, an angle on, on them when you are grinding so you need to check this when you grind you can feel what you have the, the position here and remember we are only going to take about uh, uh, point zero 0.05 millimeters so maybe just a turn at, to start with to see if we are taking some materials out we have to check if, if it's lining and it is one smart thing to, sh to, to do when you're grinding rings is to only grind one side you, you always have the other side at square to the ring and you can use that side of the ring 
to control if you are grinding the rings exactly perpendicular to the to the other half and this becomes more important when you have more to grind like in a Viseco piston or a GE piston when you have a lot of grind on these rings on this standard setup like we're doing now there are pretty ready to race out of the box these rings but I'm I'm just telling you so you don't get all over the place because this grinder is made for to push the rings together like that and if you're aligning the rings wrong here you are going to get wrong alignment in the rings span so only grind one side and double control double check that you are aligned and you should be okay to go it only took about 0 0.01 millimeters of of uh, material when I'm just doing one turn so I'm I think I'm going to do two turns and keep a little more pressure at the ring here still fine back and controlling we are not good enough I think I need two more turns but we are slowly getting there um. one two we are five turns into the ring and we are almost there I think two more turns will do the trick for this one so we try two more turns lining up the ring I think that was two turns let's try again okay seven turns did the trick and we are at point 65 at the bottom ring second ring and when you're finished with uh, cutting the edge on the, the ring you are going to break the sharp sharpness of the rings that come up with uh, the tool so we're going to take a uh, diamond hone I don't know what this is called in English but it's uh, diamond brand it says yeah maybe you're familiar with this already in Sweden we call it a bryne just some light touches so we don't have any rough edges at this ring and this ring is all set can't really see any light uh, between it so successful uh, seven turns and it did the work so in the next three rings I have to grind I, I will take about five turns test measure and do the last two turns within a little more controlled way finished polished the wrist pins as you can see a big difference I'm going to take you with me when I'm going to assemble a complete kit with cornrod, piston, piston rings, wrist pin all that stuff here we have one of the pistons we are going to call this the number one cylinder and we are going to start with the oil rings this is a new piston so no contamination in the piston ring lens so we're starting with a, the oil ring and uh, you should always check if there are a stamp or something like it on the on the rings I don't know if you see but here's a stamp I'm always mounting the rings with a stamp up against the cylinder head and this kind of piston rings I'm 
forcing this at first in the oil groove and then we are pushing this over so oil ring second ring same with that on this side it says nothing here it says top so this is going to be at the top of the piston and this ring is the hardest to get on actually so you don't want to force this in the groove you just massage it to the place it will sit and like that it's sitting there and the first ring same thing with that always check if there are some text and here you have a text and this will be the upside so uh, I'm leaving the rings like they are for now remember last thing we watched when we put the engine out of the Volvo 240 was that the piston gap piston ring gap was just above each other this is fairly important to not do it like that you should rotate them every opening should be at least 120 degrees apart or like three places when that's fixed that's not really much to it at all and if you've done it like me and um, you have resurfaced the pistons the the pointer here is gone it's an uh, arrow in this area that shows you that the, the piston is going to sit with this side and the, in the front because the hole in the piston is slightly offset you are in the expansion cycle it's gonna have a straight rod because of the offset piss pin so it's important to set the pistons with the front in the front and if you do it like i have done here lost the arrow this is always the back of the piston this square is the back so this is the front of our piston and I like to set the, the stops for the bearing. I like to set them under the intake, uh, intake manifold. So if this is front of the piston, you have the intake manifold on this side. So I'm going to install it like that with the stops like so, like that. But first we have to get our locks in position, or at least one lock. And this can be a little tricky one. But I'm going to show you an easy way to solve this. First I'm going to take a little bit of oil here. On both sides. And I'm just going to take a plier. Force this down in the like so, sitting in the middle and I'm taking um, the wrist pin from the other side so one end stop ready a little bit of oil some oil on the wrist pin The lock here is really easy to install. Just do it like that and it pops in. Here we have one part assembled, piston with connecting rod. Update in the middle of the episode. It's been a while since I last recorded something on this uh, build series here. 
and uh, I think I left off when I was assembled one of the pistons with the, the rods and I completed the rest of them and as I can see right now it's time for me to insert the stainless steel wire to the o-ring grooves and uh, I'm going to show you that right now here you can see me installing the stainless steel wire into the cylinder grooves that I made around the cylinders and this is not a very advanced work you just tap the ring in place and if it's not staying in place you can use some kind of CA glue let it stay well it's time for me to install in the crankshaft in the engine and uh, uh, here we are up to installing the girdle on the engine and this is a chapter that I want to uh, film in this video because I, I want to show you how I mount the, the girdle in the engine and um, it's not complicated at all but it's some steps that you should uh, bring with you when you're installing the girdle so here the, the cranks is in position and I have to align all the, the main caps and you, you can see me installing the black silicone black RV silicone or what it's called it's um, just regular engine silicone that you can buy in every store that sells engine re related parts It's, it's time to put the shims on the, the caps and there are two different shims on this girl setup one that have a notch for the main cap because it's a little dent in the middle and one is a solid shim that's taking up the slack between the girl and the, the first shim be aware when you're laying down your girdle that you're laying it in the right position because you can flip it around and it and all the bolts for the oil pan will not fit so be aware of that and first align the main crankshaft bearing uh, bolts so that you're forcing the girdle into place and a very important step in this girl mount is that you have to align the girl very exactly so you have to mount kind of every bolt for the the oil pan uh, lining up all the all the shims now we are going to torque the caps through the girl and uh, a apply a little bit of oil to this so you're for getting the right amount of torque to the bolt and when you have torqued the bolts here you are kind of set for this it's not very much to it and when you're torquing the engine you are torquing this, this as original spec so in this case I'm talking it to 150 newton meters. When you when you're using a, a regular oil pan, you can use the the gasket that's are meant for the oil pan. Um, you're you're using glue between the block and the girdle. And the girdle and the oil pan you're using a regular gasket here I'm checking for clearance there are no big problems in this setup you can have some clearance issue if you have a, a custom crank but this is an original crank and it's no not a big problem here I'm installing some pistons if you have done a nice chamfer when you're resurface the the blocks you should 
get the pistons to seat really easy into the cylinder. If it's a sharp edge, you have a nightmare to install the pistons if you have resurfaced uh, the engine block. It's the same procedure here, but I'm using ARP grease because uh, the torque specs are used with um, ARP grease and uh, I, if I remember right there are 70 Nm on my bolts. This procedure is the same for all four pistons. Here we are looking at the auxiliary shafts and I'm pointing at the, the cam lobe for the mechanical fuel pump that sits on the carburetor engines. I have grinded that down so I got a 5mm wide knock here so I can trigger my home signal at the auxiliary shaft. This is a really nice op option if you want to get a home signal on your engine. I'm planning to use this M12 by 1mm Hall effect sensor. Uh, I have designed a kind of um, bracket for this already. Uh, this is the hose that go from the oil breeder uh, box under the intake and uh, down back in the the oil sump, oil pan. And uh, that kind of um, hose is very important in these engines because if you don't use this hose you're going to put a lot of oil in the oil breeder black box and um, it, it's worth the, the problem to get one of these hoses no problems here in Sweden but I don't know in your countries but uh, I really suggest that you installing this uh, hose again and here I'm just showing you where the hose should align in the block between the oil pump and um, it's a little bracket down there in it as I'm pointing at right now that bracket should be mounted so it helps the hose if you don't use the bracket you are going to tangle up the hose in the crank and that's not a good thing to do here in, the, in my case I haven't torqued down the oil pump so this is why I can fiddle around with this hose right now. Don't know what I'm saying here but I think what I'm saying now is everything that you need to know about this. Back to the video. One thing I have to talk about when it comes to assemble the front end on the engine here with the, the wheels and stuff is like you have to use an um, thread lock on this. this. This is Loctite 243. It's a blue one. You can easily break this with a torque wrench. It's not permanent stuff but it will hold all the bolts in the place if you have high revving engine and uh, some torsions in your uh, crank uh, that stuff is very hard for um, threads and bolts and they will easily come loose if you have uh, some problems and over revved engine or something like that if you use Loctite no more problem easy life and here we are in the last steps of making this engine an engine and I have to show you another thing that's kind of important. I've tried a lot of oil filters and it's very tempting to uh, use a cheap oil filter when you're starting up your engine and you know that you're going to change oil very soon after that when you have a start engine and there are some problems with the cheap filters. They can unscrew themselves drop it on the floor and if you're not aware you can drain the oil in the engine 
quickly as nothing else and you can have a problem with the, the, the valve in the filters that not letting the proper oil come up to the pressure it needs to be. So this is not a very expensive solution. It's, an, it's a kind of a cheap insurance that you you're starting the engine and everything is working right from the start. So a nice Bosch filter or Volvo Original or something like something with a brand on is what you have to use on this startup. You remember when I grind the auxiliary shaft? Here is the mechanical fuel pump that's sitting on the, the carburetor engines. And when you use an injection kind of uh, system in your, on your engine, you don't use this port in your, in your engine. Some, some engines do, doesn't have this bored out, but this is easy to bore out if you want to use this as a cam home position. It's right in the center now and passing through and if you have if you have the sensor in an angle like this you can adjust it so it sends this knock right here and uh, I think that's uh, the best solution to get the home signal on this red box I've seen a lot of sketchy things mounted in the front of them and you, you don't really want any homemade bracket for any sensor to jump loose and hop right into the drive belt here. And when you see this build now, how, how can I say this is in 600 horsepower build? Uh, that's because of the, the first thing that's going to give up in this engine is the original corn rods, the rods in the engine. And when you change into age profile rods, you are in increasing the amount of power you can put through these engines. They are really good at taking care of the power, the, the, the pistons, the crankshaft, everything is working really good with um, power levels like 600 horsepower. And if you have a good cylinders, uh, a nice freshly built engine like this, you, it's going to last, it's going to be a good uh, work or horse for you and your car. So the first thing you have to do is uh, buy you some age profile rods. Uh, second thing you have to thought of is the, the belt pulley or the timing belt pulley that I showed you that is a better version than Volvo left you with. And uh, all other things is just some minor adjustments and touch-ups so the the main things are the rods and the rods aren't that expensive to buy i think it's about 400 dollars or something like that on on a kit with rods including uh, arp bolts using good bearings good rings uh, you don't have to make this o-ring block here you can buy a cooper ring gasket and you're good to go without any surfacing or something on the block but it's always good to surface the block so you know it's straight but there are no known issues with these blocks and if you build this with your logic mind it will last on you uh, the girdle I mounted on this is mainly because I want to show my audience what what it is and how I mount it and uh, what it can do for your engine and it's going to improve the stability of this engine a lot I know that for sure and uh, I, I have I have the engines like this built uh, for a drag racing car that I have early in my life a little earlier for, for some years ago and uh, that engine that red block engine was powered by th that engine was um, putting out 1200 horsepower with the methanol and I had some slightly issues with the, the bearings on that one until I mounted the, the girdle and that point the, the, the bearing issues was blown away no more problems with the bearings and the, the engine lost 
I never had a problem with the Indian really, but it was a drag racing Indian and they don't run for very long. And I really have to say that thank you very much for watching my videos and um, the last video I did on this was... Uh, I'm blown away. I think I have uh, nearly 90,000 view views on that one now and... What can I say? Thank you a lot. That's really nice to see that the time I take to, to film all these videos and edit them is worth it is worth the time for me. I, I had a really struggle to get time to build this engine right now. It's uh, I have so many things I have to do in my workshop this time of the year. So I'm overwhelmed by customers' work and they have to come first. Last time it put out 540 horsepower at the, at the wheels and this time maybe a little more, I don't know but a uh, really nice seated engine should be uh, putting out a little bit more I think. It's going to be very interesting to watch and see. I got a lot of questions of this build. I can't answer them all in the comments field. I'm just too busy to answer them all. So I'm planning to do an, uh, a video there. I will answer the most common questions and the most important questions. There are a lot of things I know I'm missing to show you here, but I think I'm going to get the most important with me in this build. With these words, I want to thank you all for watching. We see each other in the next episode. Thank you for watching. Bye.